Hey everyone, I'm Rod Roddenberry, and you're listening to Trek FM. Hello, and welcome to Episode 9 of Stage 9, Trek FM show about the people who make Star Trek. I'm Mike. I'm John. And today we're going to be talking about Star Trek Beyond. It's finally here. It got here ready and raring to go beyond. After all this time talking about the people who were involved in the making of, of the movie, now to actually see the finished project all put together, mm-hmm. it's, yeah. it's, it's something. So we're going to give our personal thoughts on the movie, just like everybody else. But then the, the angle that we're going to take is to see what we think about Justin Lin's contribution as director and Simon Pegg and Doug Jung's contributions as writers and J.J. Abrams' co- contribution as producer. Yeah. so That's our thing. Yeah. And we're, we have a lot of news as well, obviously, but we're going to start <laughs> off yeah. with Beyond and, and work our way into the news. Um, so, yeah. Let's start off with Beyond. Um We're going to work under the assumption that anybody listening to a deep cut podcast on the Mm -hmm. Trek FM network Mm -hmm. a week after the release of the first movie in over three years will have seen the movie. So spoilers, spoilers, spoilers for everyone. Not holding anything back. (laughs) Nope. But for those people who may not have seen it and want to live on the edge... Um, do you want to give a brief synopsis of this film? Or yes. I should say movie, since it was shot digitally. Okay, the thrust of this movie is that Jim Kirk is feeling a little bit... He's questioning his role in Starfleet and the world. Um, it's his, you know, it's coming up on his birthday. He doesn't like to make a big deal about it. And uh, life is feeling a little bit stagnant to him. He's looking at new opportunities. He's even put in a uh, request to be promoted to vice admiral and uh of course as always with star trek one last mission shows up before the decision can be made about his promotion and it's an intriguing mission about an alien race that has been ambushed and lost their ship and they need help getting their crew and of course things are never what they seem and so they go beyond the nebula in front of them and uh, encounter an enemy ready and willing to wipe them out. Yes. So what did you think about it? I thought it was kinetic. I thought it was fun. I laughed out loud. I really truly enjoyed this and I truly enjoyed, I no lie. I know that this is a charged comment because into Darkness is still a relatively um, divisive movie among the fan base. But this was the sequel that I feel I deserved back when Into Darkness came out. This is what I wanted to see. There was forward movement with the characters. There was forward movement with the story. There was a lot of movement on screen, which I thought was beautifully handled, compellingly put together. Is it a five-star Godfather movie? No. But is it the most fun I've had at a Star Trek movie in years? Yes. Did I feel that the character development was handled really well? Yes. Is the movie a success? Yes. I think Justin Lin should be proud. And what did you think? Uh, I liked it a lot. I was a little nervous going into it, as I always am going into a Star Trek movie. And that, that first viewing is always kind of like almost you know, sort of like looking at it through the analytical eye that you normally look at a, at, at a movie with on a second viewing mm-hmm. because I'm like, I'm so caught up and I'm like, please make sure you don't do anything that breaks this, you know? And then it's like once I sort of like get to the end and I'm like, okay, yeah, that's good. Then on the second viewing, I can sort of like relax and just watch it. Yeah. Um. But uh, yeah, no, I, I thought it was, I thought it was very good. I, you know, the comments which I'm seeing coming out of everything is like, this is the movie that I've been waiting for. This is the best of the Kelvin timeline movies. You know, this is, is certainly, you know, what they should have been doing from the beginning and all this stuff. And I honestly 
don't agree with any of that. I think that mm-hmm. this is by far the least good of the Kelvin timeline movies. Oh, nuts. <laughs> that is a that's a crazy comment. <laughs> I can I can have an argument with you about 09 versus I don't think that this movie can exist outside of 09. I think that this movie is and I I've never beaten up 09. I'm perfectly happy with 09. I thought that 09 was a great job of reestablishing everything and getting it started again. And I thought that it was, you know, it too was fun and kinetic and and worth watching. This, Into Darkness, the biggest problem I had with it that I still have with it is that it's stagnant. It just feels like it's stuck in place, that it's just taking 09 and saying, okay, let's tweak a few things and yeah, here's the movie. Whereas this feels like, okay, well, we know where they are have been let's forgive me for this let's push beyond that and take them to the next level that we all want to get them to that's why i say this is the sequel that i wanted is it better than 09 i you know that's splitting hairs to me um but it's it's definitely i I mean my initial reaction is that it's as good as but even though it can't exist like this is this is the type of sequel that can't really exist outside of it like you need 09 going into this to truly grasp everything that's going on. Uh, you, do I think somebody could come into it cold like my wife? Probably. And she'd do okay with it. Um, because I don't think that there's anything so big that, that you know, breaks that. But it would be like showing Dark Knight Rises to somebody who hasn't seen Batman Begins or The Dark Knight. They'd be like, oh, well, that's a good movie. But wait, that... Who was that Two-Face guy again? You know, like, it's it's that sort of thing. Yeah, no, I mean, I see what you're saying. And I guess, yeah, my, my biggest complaint with Into Darkness was really that it, it did, like, I feel like with um, 09, you know, they were obviously setting up this new timeline. And I think the way that it ends, especially with, you know, the opening of the, of the original series in, in a lot of ways, is kind of like saying, okay, we did it. We got us back to where we wanted to be. We got us back to where everyone wants us to be. And now we can go off onto our five-year mission. And then with Into Darkness, I feel like, you know, they did say like, okay, and with this movie, we are going to show how they got onto their five-year mission. It's like, well, did, didn't we just see that? I think we just yes. saw that. You know, and and I can totally see that criticism, and I, I have that criticism of the movie. But I think that Into Darkness has a lot of other stuff going on in it, which is um, really really interesting. And I mean, the interesting thing about it is, like, for the past three years, I've sort of questioned my love for Into Darkness, not because I didn't love it, but because of everyone else's criticisms of it. Sure. And it, you know, my my. my thinking like internally i've never said this out loud but i'll say it out loud now is you know maybe the only reason why i like into darkness is just because it's the newest least familiar trek and you know just like with anything just like with episode seven for example you know we've all seen the other six movies fifteen thousand times so we're going to get more out of a viewing of episode seven than we are out of any of the other star wars movies so we're going to watch it a bunch right and we're going to enjoy watching it more than we're going to enjoy watching the empire strikes back even though empire is clearly a better movie you know Mm. um but when i was watching this i i had a sort of a unique experience i saw the movie on its own i saw beyond on its own and then the next day i went to the trilogy marathon at at a a navy pier and Mm -hmm. i saw you know all three films back to back in imax and what and and what i found was that in a lot of ways my not being over the moon for beyond sort of legitimized my personal love for into darkness mm. because now beyond is the newest thing right beyond is is brand new mm-hmm. and and into mm-hmm. darkness is you know that thing that's been around for 3 years and yet i was still more invested in watching into darkness than the movie which I had only seen once mere hours before. You know what I mean? I I completely understand what you're saying. And so I would say that possibly then playing into my reaction to Beyond is that I did not have that reaction to Into Darkness. 
And so when Beyond, you know, appears before me, I, I too went in with the trepidation of, oh man, uh, this could go wrong. And again, it's not perfect. It's not perfect. But the highest compliment I can give is that this, even though it's in the Kelvin timeline, I do agree with the comments. This feels like my Star Trek, you know, quote unquote, my Star Trek. This has the tone, this hat, but while at the same time being a Justin Lin movie, this is a Justin Lin movie. There's no doubt to me. Like, I can't confuse this style or this storytelling technique even though it's comfortable in the same universe as uh, as the way that Abrams did it, even though it's comfortable there, I can tell that a different director is there, and I can I can enjoy that. It's still his movie, and since I like Justin Lin movies, there you go. And we'll get into that in just a second. I guess the one thing that I would say in terms of beyond and and sort of just because I know I sound like I'm coming down you know semi hard on it. And I, I don't want that to be the case. You know, I mean, it, it, it's not it did not blow me away like I hoped it would. I don't I don't think it's the best movie of the year. I don't think it's better than 10 Cloverfield Lane. You know what I mean? No, I, I agree with that. But were when, you expecting were you expecting a transcendent Trek experience? I'm always expecting a transcendent Trek experience. And the fact that I got one the last two times out, I was really hoping for it here. I certainly, you know, watching the trailers and everything, I had my doubts in the main one being like, okay, they blow up the ship, the ship, you know, a third of the way into the movie. And I didn't have a problem with, you know, conceptually them blowing up the ship, but I knew what that meant was they were going to be spending basically the entire movie on that planet. And I mean, one of the things which, you know, I, I thought of, you know, going into, you know, when was Star Trek Beyond, I mean, two years ago, and we'll talk about this later on, but two years ago, we interviewed J.D. Payne and Patrick McKay, who were writing the new mm-hmm. movies. And they said, okay, we're going to turn around the questioning here. What do you want to see out of the next Star Trek movie? And the thing that I said was, I want to see Captain Kirk on the bridge actually captaining a starship, you know, because every every chance they have to get him off the bridge of that ship and have him running around on some planet or shooting some guy or jumping on something, they do, you know? And it's like, he's got that chair there. It looks really comfortable. Let's have him sit in it for a while and command a starship. And that was lacking from the first two movies, and that's really lacking from this one because... You know, they spend most of the time on the planet. And by spending so much time Mm. on the planet, I feel like the movie feels much smaller than I would have hoped for something which is like a 50th anniversary movie. I want like this grand epic scale storytelling that you see in a lot of other movies. And and just just one more thing about that. And and this is, you know, I guess will somewhat lead into Justin Lin's directing too, is like... When they're down on the planet, it's great, it's fun, and everything, and I enjoy it. But anytime they're up in space, I'm like, oh my god, this is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. I mean, the destruction of the Enterprise was fantastically done. And that sequence at the end with the Franklin, the sabotage sequence, Mm -hmm. I mean, that's one of the best things ever in any Star Trek movie. I loved that scene so much. It was pretty great. You know, and it's like when we see that, we get this little taste at the beginning and at the end. It's like, I want Justin Lin to make another Star Trek movie where, you know, this time the big thing was like, we can't have them go to Earth. They've got to be out in deep space. Next, next movie, Justin Lin directs the rule. They're not allowed to leave the ship. They've got to stay on the ship the entire time. That's the movie I want to see. Given that Payne and McKay are writing the next one, you may get your wish. (laughs) You never know. (laughs) You know. Well, okay, I understand what you're saying, um, and I will respectfully disagree because I think that the nicest thing to get for a 50th anniversary movie is to get something that uh, breaks down and appreciates the characters and gives you a true appreciation for uh, who they are, who they are in relation to each other, and the character moments. I don't care whether they're on the bridge or not. I feel that this 
of the Kelvin timeline movies, I finally felt like Kirk was a captain. Like, I understood why people listened to him. He was intelligent. He was decisive without being authoritative. He, um, or I'm not authoritative, but authoritarian. He listened, like, he got the best out of everybody. He, and they put him in these situations that really highlighted that. And I really liked that about this this movie and i actually really enjoyed i mean the the spock and bones interaction scenes when they're off alone beautiful man i mean it's like the, the, those scenes alone were the moments where i was so immersed in it and i said whoever you know i obviously not talking to myself in the theater but it's that you get a, a wash in that feeling of the people who made this movie get it they understand where the strength of all of this is, and it's in these character moments that exist. The story that's going on frames everything, and you get your. And I agree with you. The sabotage sequence was fantastic. I loved it. I was giggling through the whole thing. I was like, yes. And when I mean, you know, when Scotty um, comes in and it's fight the power is playing. Yeah. <laughs> like I was, it was I. I guffawed in the theater, and it was it was such a great moment, but. You know, he can be on the bridge and not reflect like a in the previous two movies, like in Into Darkness. I was like, he doesn't he still doesn't feel like he belongs in that chair. Whereas with this, I felt like he belonged leading people like I could understand the loyalty. So, yeah, although it go. is weird, though, that they reach this point where it's like this is the first time that Captain Kirk feels like he actually deserves to be captain. And they're like, now we're. we're we're going to make him an admiral. And it's like, wait a minute. No, no, he does not. No, he's not admiral yet. Are you, are you kidding me? What are you talking about? Vice here? admiral. Okay. Vice admiral. And whatever. he was applying because, and, and again, that ties into the beautiful character scene of, he was questioning it. You know, I mean, in, in a sense, it's, um, it's something that I think a lot of people can relate to where you're, you're sort you know, you're going to your job every day. You know, he says it feels episodic. It's the same day in and day out. And you sit there sometimes and you wonder, yeah, should I, should I be going for the promotion? What's, what am I supposed to be doing right now? Yeah. You're, you're trying to figure things out. And, uh, you know, I guess the the point of attack for people's reactions to it will probably be based on how much they liked Into Darkness. I mean, that, that might be. In a lot of ways, I think it's good that they got away from the people who made the last two movies because I feel like the people who made this movie aren't very precious about the last two in fact i get the impression that they don't even like in the darkness <laughs> um, you mean by the fact that you can completely ignore it by the fact that you can completely ignore it by the fact that you know simon Pegg is on twitter saying in a couple months we're gonna go beyond darkness or out of the darkness you know other uh, things like that i mean yeah i i think that that they didn't like i mean jj has even said that you know he's not super happy with it so you know, I, I think that, that that's good, that by getting away from the people who, you know, created this current mythology, in a sense, mm -hmm. I think that you open yourself up to other ideas, and instead of trying to continue storylines, which maybe should be dropped, you're dropping them and just doing oh. your own thing. Okay, but but see, that, that spurs for me an interesting question then, because let's say episode seven never happens in our timeline we're, we're living in the episode seven timeline but but the red matter never fires and so jj abrams stays on because the success of into darkness would sort of demand he stays in the director's chair right mm -hmm. you know for, yeah. for the sequel they'd want him on there mm -hmm. and so i mean how do you see this going differently if abrams is still in the director's chair i mean even you are willing to acknowledge that there were some things that didn't fire quite. He acknowledges there are things that didn't fire quite right within the darkness. Do you see the same sort of refreshing factor that this brings with a different crew? I don't know if it is going to be as refreshing, but I think at the same time, it'll be more skillfully made. And I know that that's going to sound really bad. That's not a knock on Justin Lin at all. It's, that sounds awful though. What on <laughs> earth do you mean by that? It's not a knock on Justin Lin at all because I mean, we just did a whole freaking series on Justin Lin and how awesome his movies are. But as I've said on numerous occasions, I think that JJ Abrams is one of the best filmmakers working today. 
You think he takes this script and makes something better than what Justin Lin made? I don't think he takes the script. I think he takes a different script. You know. So he directs Payne and McKay's script? I don't know what he does. I don't think he does because I think he's the one who got rid of the Payne and McKay script, but I think he mm. comes up with something else. You know, I don't know what he does. I really don't. But I think whatever it is is going to be pretty spectacular. See, the and I think we should table the discussion because I think I've figured out why Abrams should not direct sequels to his own work. Okay. But that I, I think I feel like that that's a much bigger discussion and it's going to cause you to to be angry at me. So what did you think of Justin Lin? I mean, what did you think, though, separating it from the comparison to yeah. Abrams? What did you think of Lin's direction? I thought it was amazing. I mean, like I was saying before with the space stuff, I was just constantly blown away by the images on screen. I mean, these were like the first time I watched it, I was repeatedly just sort of in awe of the visuals and kept on thinking to myself, like, I've never seen anything like this in a Star Trek movie before. I've never seen anything like this. You know, maybe once when they got down to the planet, I was like, yeah, yeah, this is all kind of familiar. But like the space stuff, which you would think would be the hardest thing to make unique because we've seen how many thousands of space battles, you know, over the years, Mm -hmm, over the past mm -hmm. 50 years. And yet he made the space stuff so unique. I mean, just aesthetically, you know, the design of the Yorktown is amazing, you know, and the way that he moves the camera through it. Even just like skillful little things like during the captain's log sequence, you know, where he's talking about, you know, the 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 life or whatever that that little montage is very well done and is very well you know written and sort of like you get like lots of things like everything's feeling episodic and it's like oh that's funny Mm -hmm. you know (laughs) you you get the you know the shot of kirk opening up his closet and seeing the same you know shirts over and over again but then you also have like things where it's just like a little touch where it's like it just shows the the effort which he puts into little details when he says like you know the the crew has you know lit, led this has led the crew to some interesting interactions some for the better and then they show like the two crew members like hooking up you know like kissing yeah. and closing the door and then it says and some for the worse and then you see you know the Orion you know girl throwing mm-hmm. you know check off out of the thing <laughs> and yep. You know, most people would be like, I mean, that is a very sort of typical, like, you know, point point and counterpoint, you know, and you would expect to see those two things. And But the way that he does it is, like, these two crew members in close-up go into this room, the door closes, and then the camera whip pans over to this. I mean, it's all in one shot, you know, yep. and then you see, like, point and counterpoint in the same hallway. And... Like that stuff, like that attention to detail, I'm like, wow, you know, that's what sets Justin Lin apart from most directors. You know, he 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 thinks of things very, very visually, you know, not I mean, everyone's like, well, he's a huge action director, so he's going to do be great at action it's like yeah he's going to be great at action but he's not just a huge action director he's a very very visual director and he's going to you know move the camera in a manner which is you know unparalleled really it's kind of amazing and yeah i i i I completely agree with you Uh, and with the the camera movement on the yorktown when it when it spins where i just recently read um, for the first time, uh, Ring World by Larry Niven. And yeah. it was very evocative of the, the way things are described in that, where it's like you're walking along and there's a giant ring above you. And the the way that he did the action with the Zero-G fight, but also the fight on the Enterprise as the hallways are turning around, yeah. was, there. you know, I will give Into Darkness when the ship's falling apart and they're running through the hallways. That was kind of, you know, that was neat. I was like, oh, that's clever. Whereas this took that and made it even more insane, like to, to the point where it almost took me out to say, how did they, how did they pull that off? Mm-hmm. How did like I wanted to I wanted the magician to show me how they did the trick because I was so I, like flabbergasted by the way that Kirk flew across and the the floor moved and he went through you know like that was so neat and even when they were uh, going through the uh, 
you know, uh, the, going through the saucer section and spinning things around was just, you know, that's that's some special stuff happening right there. There's the shot where it's such a beautiful shot. Um, Kirk gets into the escape pod and mm, you're, you're yes. looking out the window over his shoulder and you as he ejects and you see the Enterprise fall you know, yeah. away from him, you know, and then the, the camera racks focus and you see his reflection in the window. There's so much going on in that shot, but just the idea of it's like we've set up that these pods are shooting off the Enterprise because we're seeing it with the camera essentially on the Enterprise as they're being shot off. Now we're going to turn it around and just the idea of like, I mean, for one thing, it's just the emotional moment for Kirk where it's like he's losing his ship, you know, but also just the idea of like we were literally like the camera and Kirk were literally on the ship mere seconds ago. And now it is way, 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 way down there about to crash into the ground. And it's yeah. like, you know, that's 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 awesome. It's I mean, that is like masterclass filmmaking right there, you know. Agree. Yeah. Agree. So, okay. Um, I mean, uh, where, where, where do you think this, uh, this kind of fits into his filmography? Do you see, uh, I mean, I mean, not, not Man. necessarily in terms of ranking it, but I, I see a Justin Lin who has confidently made fast five, whereas the ending of furious six got a little out of hand. Um, I, I think that this is more evocative of his, knowing when to go like super big and then not not go too far not have you know like the the ending of 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 fast and furious six is it's a little it's a little much it, it gets a little out of control so i i i think he this shows that he has learned his his lessons from you know fast and furious six and then he pulls back a little bit and has a tighter control over things that like that this is that justin lynn to me this is the fat this is the fast five justin lynn is what i'm seeing at play here yeah i could see that i mean i still think that fast five is his best movie but this is i mean a close second for me and you know i think it's it's interesting that he is kind of able to stretch his legs in a different medium and and, and that sort of thing and balance you know character stuff with uh you know big action set pieces which is what you know he he did in a lot of his movies mm -hmm. so yeah i think it's pretty pretty spot on now what about the the script uh simon Pegg and doug jung do you, do you see anything about that which sort of like signals <laughs> them um i i really enjoyed it i, I mean doug jung again we only did, we only did confidence so it's hard to you know really but you know there's that whole switch at the end of this you know the 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 surprise at the end about you know the the villain's origins and everything mm -hmm. um and, and the way that it, you know it's sort of constructed like that i think that this is in terms of what simon Pegg has written it's appropriately meta at the right points and i i, I was talking with somebody else uh I, I was talking with a friend of mine who who just saw it and um I, what I said to him was suspiciously Scotty's role seemed to be really big in this movie, comparatively speaking. And then I, you know, I just paused for a second and I said, but of course, if I wrote a movie, it would be the John's John Mills show through the entire thing. So I'm not begrudging him that. Yeah, I guess I was kind of surprised by that because I kind of thought he'd be like, I don't want to, you know, but then thinking about it, like he's always the star of his movie. So it does make sense to a certain. Well, I point. also I honestly I also liked I took it. I don't know if this is intentional or not intentional or not, but I, Scotty's whole escape from the Enterprise very much struck me along as a, a James Bond tribute. Mm hmm. Yeah, like that—that that is what that struck me as. And if that was intentional, great. If it was unintentional, still great. <laughs> yeah, so. I, I mean, I think like the big thing, like, because it doesn't feel like any of his other movies, like on a tonal level. I mean, there's some mm -hmm. humor, but it's not, you know, as jokey as his other stuff, which is to be expected. I, I, I think you know, in addition to sort of like a lot of, you know nerdy references which you wouldn't normally get like for example the giant green hand you know conversation yes. which did you notice the giant green hand in the credits at the end of the 
movie? No, I it, didn't see it. I, it oh, took it took bummer. me. I think I noticed it on the my third viewing. Um, but yeah, like at one point you see like a giant green hand reach for the Enterprise or something. But, <laughs> um, but uh, you know, I I think the thing that they keep on talking about, which is that this is sort of like a deconstructionist view of star trek i think that that is something which he does a lot you know he did that with the zombie genre he did that with Mm -hmm. you know all of the movies in the cornetto trilogy and you know i think we're seeing that here just in a much more specific way you know it's not about a genre it's about you know a franchise and you know i think that that's very interesting on a conceptual level and that's that's sort of like the biggest trademark of his that i see in this in this script so yeah yeah uh i and i do want to say that uh i i think a special shout out if i were in charge of the nominating committee um i would give the costumes in this an oscar nomination uh i really i i'm no lie i thought that these were wonderfully tweaked versions of the costumes i loved every everything that they did with the you know the enterprise costumes their, their, you know, their outfits when they were on the planet were great. I, I love those jackets. Like that, that, that whole outfit was great to me. Like, I know that it seems strange, but I paid special attention to the costumes. And I thought they were all wonderfully done. That you know, they're definitely growing on me. I mean, the jackets I think are amazing. You know, yeah. I mean, I, I thought that the the costumes were decent. I, I thought that the production design was outstanding. You know, I, I really loved yeah. you know sort of the look of this. As, as far as the the cinematography was concerned, I mean, I thought that the camera movement and everything was great. Although I wasn't really a big fan of the the lighting per se, and I know. Yeah, I like I, I get that. There, were, the, for me, there were the one scene that jumped out as um, difficult to watch was when Scotty was in when he was trying to get power back to the engines when they were under attack, mm-hmm. and the camera was moving around. Like the, it it was hard to visually focus on him when he was in that little that like that's just the first thing that that popped out at me. It. I mean, I, I know, like I read a thing with the special effects people where they were talking about they were really trying to sort of grunge up the movie because that's sort of like the aesthetic that that Justin Lin likes. He likes to have that sort of dirty, lived-in look. And they also talk about how, you know, he wanted to give it sort of like a filmic look even though it was shot digitally. And I I, I always think that that's a mistake. I mean, you can totally tell that they were trying to do it. It looks like there's like a lot of artificial grain and stuff like that. But, I mean, I just wish... They would let digital be digital. I wish they would have let him yeah. shoot it on film and you know have it look like film. But um, yeah, I, I've seen it. I've seen it in both two D and three D. The three D is honestly a mess. I think they were just too rushed. I, I don't. I don't think they had enough time to do the conversion properly. But uh, it, it looks a, a lot better to me in in two D. And I got to see it in the the Dolby vision with the the laser projectors oh yeah how was that it looks fantastic check it oh, out good. it's so good so good if... i just saw it in a run-of-the-mill movie theater digitally though um of course uh and i thought you know overall it looked good yeah um it it, it makes me sad that this is the first star trek movie which i i won't see on film so a little, little tear but, <laughs> but what can you do? Uh, yeah, not much. So, okay, uh, final final point here. Um, this is a J.J. Abrams production, uh, yeah. even though he did not direct it himself. So, what what do you think makes it that? You know, we we looked at all the movies which he produced for other people. Do you see the bad robot stamp on here? Yeah, I kind of do. But can I give a truly honest answer considering they're using a ship design and, and you know, that's Abrams is, you know, the, the one that he shepherded through um, and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. But, uh, it, you know, in terms of, I, I mean, I think we've said it before, like a, the hallmark of a bad robot production is that you can tell that the resources were available. There was no like corner cutting as it were. Now, maybe there was corner cutting with a 3D conversion, <laughs> but I'll never know because I don't see movies in 3D. So there you go. Okay, yeah, fair enough. I mean, I, I think the thing that 
that really stands out to me aside from from that you know what you're saying i totally agree with um i i also think that we kind of see what we saw with mission impossible and the thing that you keep on hearing from people associated with the production is he kept on telling the people involved and justin lynn in particular like make this your own movie and i think Mm -hmm. that that's really really admirable for someone who's talking to the guy who's taking over the franchise which you built up yourself you know to say like yeah. don't be behold because there's a lot of people we won't name names but you know i know who you're talking about and i got no problem with it go ahead <laughs> there's a lot of drop people the name. <laughs> drop the name bring it there's a lot of people care. who maybe um want to use uh filmmakers directors who are working on their properties as sort of like proxies for themselves and Mm -hmm. they want a certain level of consistency which uh maybe limits creativity on the set to one degree or another that doesn't no way to talk about walt disney Mike. (laughs) that does not seem to be what (laughs) what happened here with uh star trek beyond it seems like lynn instead was constantly being pushed by Abrams to do things differently and to make things unique. And I think that that's really super cool. And I think that the movie is much better for it. You know, even though I don't, like I said, I don't like Lynn's aesthetic as much as I like Abrams's. The last thing that I would want to see is Lynn trying to do Abrams. I want Lynn, Lynn needs to be Lynn, you know? And and what we're going to get is something which is fantastic. And uh, that's what we got. And I think that's that really cool. So any any final thoughts on Beyond? Everybody, everybody listening to this has seen it by now, right? Go see it a second time if you want to. Indulge yourself. You got some time until Suicide Squad comes out. So go for it. Yeah, go for it. Um, I, I, you know, I, I've seen it three times now. I've enjoyed it each time. And uh, I'm definitely going to be seeing it some more times. So, uh, yeah, yeah, a very, very, very good movie. All right. So, you know, Star Trek Beyond, right? Okay. Mm-hmm. It's it's here. It's over. It's done. Let's move on to the next Star Trek movie because that's the way these things work, right? Yes. Now, last week we, we had a conversation which was very interesting at the time and very thought-provoking for about... <laughs> 10 hours <laughs> yes until they officially you know announced that that Star Trek 14 Star Trek Forever is um <laughs> going to be made and Chris Hemsworth is you know for sure 100% locked down and they revealed that the script is being written by JD Payne and Patrick McKay I talked a little bit about this. I recorded a little intro to the last episode just so yeah. that we don't sound like total idiots, but um, <laughs> delving into this a little you deeper. <laughs> um, Payne and McKay uh, have never had anything produced, but they've written a ton of movies, a ton of scripts, I- including the script for uh, Star Trek Thirteen, which was not used, uh, that they wrote along with Roberto Orsi when he was, was planning on, on directing it. The, mm-hmm. This script is not a modified version of theirs, uh, for, from what everyone involved has, has said. It's a completely different script. So apparently whatever they did, even though it didn't work for, for this particular movie, it was uh, good enough that Abrams hired them to write the next one. But think about it. that Star Trek has a fine tradition. Everybody knows the two pilots story. For the original series, mm-hmm. they they're getting their second chance the way Roddenberry got his. Yeah. So there you go. It's a it's a fine Trek tradition to recognize quality talent and say, you know what, this one doesn't work. Try again. Make a couple of you know changes to your approach and let's see how how it works out. And apparently, it's going to work out fine. Apparently, it is. J.J. Uh, Abrams just the other day gave an interview where he was talking about uh, this new movie, and he says that it's uh, the best story that they've had so far out of the four movies. Well, yes, but Abrams is also a producer and well-versed in, uh, you know, sort of the P.T. Barnum school uh, that goes along with movie production because he said the same thing with with the episode eight script where he said, oh, I wish I was directing it because it's the greatest script I've ever seen. So, 
you know, let's temper expectations a little bit on that one. I guess so. But when you're out promoting a movie and you're like, yeah, I'm here to tell you to go see this movie. But, you know, if I'm going to be completely honest, uh, it's not as good as the one that we're making now. You know? Yeah. I mean, I, I guess, I guess you know, people are like, ooh, ooh. But to me, it's almost like you're saying like, uh, you know, you can just wait for the next one. No. No? Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, regardless of that, I, I I'm super excited about this. You know, as as we mentioned, you know, before we we had uh, Payne and McKay on commentary Trek stars. I looked; it was two years ago. That's how long this process has been going on. Two years ago, we talked to them about uh, Star Trek 13, and obviously they couldn't tell us anything about what it was they were actually doing, but we really did sort of get into their fandom and, and everything and, and what led them to uh, writing the script and, and also how they were planning on addressing some concerns that you know people had had with Into Darkness and, and, and that sort of thing. And it's, it's really interesting uh, to hear what they have to say uh, so go check it out. It's commentary Trek stars number 87. It's called Yes And. And to entice people further, I'm not on that episode. There you so, go. So if you don't like my voice, truly the episode of commentary Trek stars <laughs> to listen to. But check it out because, I mean, you know, a lot of people don't know um, much about them since they haven't seen any of their work. But, uh, yeah. you know, it's it's... If you want an idea of who's writing the next Star Trek movie, check out the interview. All right. So now that that, that shameless plug is, is over, um, I guess we should move on to some other news about the new what? Star Trek TV show. Oh, was there news? Did it did, did something happen with the new Star Trek show? Maybe. Hmm. Maybe. Um, yes, San Diego Comic-Con did happen, just like we were talking about. And yeah. there was some news revealed in that news. Is that the uh, the show is called Star Trek Discovery? Yay! Perhaps the the uh, worst kept secret in Hollywood, but you know what? <laughs> um, it was if you go back, you can look. It was all over Twitter before before the the thing was announced. It seems like everyone knew about it, but um, Star Trek Discovery is the name of the show. Now. Yeah. Uh, one of the things which is really interesting, which was sort of revelatory to a lot of people, I think, was that they showed the ship. They showed a, yeah. a little video of the ship. And the design mm -hmm. of the ship is rather unique, wouldn't you say? I thought it was wonderful. And yes, <laughs> unique is a great, great word for it. It has a Star Trek history to it, for sure. Yes, it does. Uh, and the, but the thing is, I didn't. I speaking as somebody who didn't look at it through that, like it as, as I was watching it, that didn't trigger. It was sort of like afterwards. I enjoyed the reveal because it is, you know, maybe maybe there's uh, something rubbing off uh, on me from from you over these last several years. But it was. I looked at it and I said, "That's it's different. It's not." It's not just the same thing. They're not trying to outsleek themselves. This is a this ship has its own identity, its own feel, its own flow or and its own durability. And then of course, you know, the history of the design, the possible history of the design. You know, you know, the first, you know, almost as soon as the thing was revealed, everyone started saying like, "Look, it looks just like this ship that Ralph McQuarrie designed for an unmade Star Trek movie from like 1975, the Planet of the Titans," which, yeah. which uh, is is a, a a very interesting lost Star Trek film, which Drew and I actually talked to uh, John Tenuto about on Standard Orbit. But yeah, they brought in McQuarrie, um, who of course is uh, the guy who did a lot of the design work for. Um, Star Wars, you know, the mm -hmm. original trilogy. And a lot of his unused des designs were used as the basis for the look of Star Wars Rebels. which And the Clone Wars. There were, there were some of his earlier designs. And actually, there were some earlier designs of his that crept up in the prequels, too. Yeah, that's definitely true. Although, Rebels looks like a Ralph McQuarrie painting, to me anyway. 
I mean, that, oh no, no, oh no doubt. Like Lothal comes straight out of his uh, Alderaan paintings yeah. from from the nineteen seventies, and and uh, some of the the ship designs are are just straight literal, you know, translations of of early concepts of his. Absolutely, yes. It's such gorgeous work. He's such a great artist. I mean, he was like going way, way, way back to like when I was a kid, before I knew anything about who the people were who made movies. Like Ralph McQuarrie is one of the very, very first names that I mm -hmm. actually knew, and one of the people whose work I knew. There was these, these, this great set which maybe you had too, from Return of the Jedi, where mm -hmm. it was like uh, substantially sized like pieces of art, like as, as yeah, in like a not 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 a book, but in an envelope from his concept art for Return of the Jedi, and. Oh my god! Yeah, there, there, there was yes. Macquarie stuff was out there. I, I still have the Return of the Jedi sketchbook uh, from from the eighties. No, I will never sell it. Um, and uh, Macquarie was amazing in terms of what he put out. For, you know, and and he was incredibly influential. I think to the direction of a lot of series. I don't have my finger on the pulse of everybody's reaction to the ship. Um, that's been revealed for discovery. I kind of, I think that yes, it looks like Macquarie's, but I, there are some tweaks to it that are evocative to me of a Klingon D seven and the NX series. And the fact that it's not like that, that white grayish color. Yeah. I like, maybe that's what's selling me on it immediately. <laughs> it's something like, Oh, finally something else than just that same color for a ship. It's it's a really cool looking ship, and um, the thing about it, I mean, I guess, like it's definitely there's there's not only a Macquarie influence, but I mean, there's definitely the like they are are going out of their way almost. Like you you look at the ship and you're like that looks very similar, but you know there are some tweaks to it for sure, and you think well maybe it's coincidence, I don't know, but the pulling out of the asteroid thing. Yes. That is from like another painting that he did. And the thing which which really sort of makes it like indisputable is those two little blue lights on the yes. side. That yes. those are in his painting. You yep. know? And and during the press conference someone asked, you know, uh, uh Brian Fuller like was Macquarie uh, an inspiration and he's like, "Yeah, for sure." Um, I'm not exactly sure how much we're still trying to figure that out legally or something along those lines. They don't want another H.R. <laughs> Giger situation as what happened with uh, 20th Century Fox. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. Uh, I mean, yeah, it's it's really cool. And, and I love the fact that they're digging deep into this, you know, sort of archive and pulling out this very, very unique design for this ship. It's It, it makes me very happy. So, but could you understand if somebody didn't like the ship? Sure, because it looks weird, you know? Yeah. It's it's weird and offbeat, and it's not like every other ship. And I mean, I think a lot of people probably had the same reaction to Deep Space Nine when they saw that, you know? and oh, that's true. And the thing that, that people could say, you know, back then is like, well, it's alien. You know, it's supposed to look weird. It's supposed to be offbeat, you know? And this one, you know, maybe you could say like, well, it's a Federation ship, and Federation ships have a certain aesthetic, and this is you know, bizarre, but I like yeah. the fact that it is so unique. It does not look like all the other enterprises and, and yet it's still, you know, definitely Federation in design. It's got the saucer section. It's got the nacelles. Yeah. And, and I, I really do like the way that this ship looks. I have to say for me, I really like it just because it looks durable. Yeah. It, it, it looks like the type of ship you send into deep space and you you kind of are accepting like there there's nothing on it that looks like it's delicate. It looks like you know if an asteroid hits it, it it'll you know it'll affect it, but not everybody's going to die immediately. You know you like this is the type of ship I would step on and be like, all right, I feel okay about flying out there in this. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's a cool looking ship. Uh, the other piece of news which was revealed um, apparently according to Deadline. Uh, the director of the pilot is going to be David Semel, if I'm pronouncing that right. Is that how it's pronounced? I don't know. How would you pronounce I, it? I would have said Semel. All right. Well, we'll say both, and then that way okay. 
one of us will be right. We're covered. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, prior to this, it certainly appeared that Alex Kurtzman was going to be directing the pilot, even though there wasn't an official announcement. He was listed on the, the IMDb, and he was listed in uh, Mark Worthington, the production designer's resume, as uh, the director of the pilot. And, you know, I have a feeling that he was planning on directing it, and with the mummy creeping up on him, he's like, yeah, there's no way that this is happening. But maybe that was just, you know, misinformation, too. Who knows? I don't know. But he's not doing it. It's David Semel. 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 He is a a very, very prolific uh, television director. He was nominated for the pilot for Heroes, which, you know, this is becoming a really big heroes reunion apparently (laughs) yeah it is and you know say what you want about heroes and god knows i have but one thing that i always said about that show was it looks freaking amazing you know i haven't seen it so i can't speak to that but i he got a nomination for house as well didn't he yeah because i think he was you know we were talking about like producing directors you know a couple weeks ago and and I believe he was the producing director on House, and House got nominated for Best Drama, so he got nominated for that. Uh, but he's done a lot of television shows, including Party of Five, which I love. I, I love Party of Five so much. Mm. Beverly Hills, 90210, Seventh Heaven, Chicago Hope, another great show. Buffy That the, was a great show. Yeah, right? David E. Kelly. And he's done a lot of David E. Kelly shows. Um, he did Buffy and Angel, Judging Amy, Roswell again. There you go. Boston Public, which may be my favorite David E. Kelly show. Uh, that was a good show. I didn't watch all watch it all the time, but I you know I watched. I remember catching a couple episodes. I really liked that. Oh man, I wish they'd release that on DVD. I, I need that show so badly. Um, the Practice and Ally McBeal, which were a great you know sort of. Um, yin and yang uh for david e kelly that's a good way to describe that like he wrote like all the episodes of both and they were both like the same premise but one was a wacky comedy and one was a hardcore drama they crossed over and they both won best drama and best comedy in the same year at the emmys one year which is i don't know i love that uh, he did American Dreams, Studio 60 on the Sunset Strip. Oh, my God, that show was so good. So good. Uh, yes, another short-lived, really good show. CSI, Homeland. Um, Which the first two seasons of Homeland were wonderful. I have not watched the third. Did I watch the third season? Everything, Honestly, with Homeland, everything started blending. Yeah, I think I saw only the first two seasons, but I really enjoyed them. I I, I need to see that show. I mean, I I love 24, and I know a lot of the 24 people went over to make Homeland. And um, yeah, I I need to see that show. Yeah, that's good. It's worth it. Yeah. Um, American Horror Story, uh, Hannibal, which uh, is one episode. Brian Fuller. Now, which episode was this? Uh, I can't pronounce any of the names in this season of Hannibal. It yeah, t- I guess if we're having trouble with Semel. Takiyawasi? <laughs> Takiyawes? Yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah, T-A-K-I-A-W-A-S-E. Correct me. Feel free. I have no idea. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, the Beehive one. If anybody, Because uh, I actually looked it up because I was like, oh, wait, wh- which one was that? Yeah, it's the Beehive one. And if anybody's seen the Beehive one, yeah, it's it stays with you. I mean, I mean, the thing is, I sound repetitive though because I talk about other episodes of Hannibal. I'm like, oh, that sticks with you. Yes, that's a that's a theme with Hannibal. But it's uh, the be the Beehive one with Amanda Plummer, and it is um, it's really unique, man. It's really unique what the killer does in that in that uh, episode. I I need to watch that show. I need to finish up Wonderfalls and and get on the rest of Fuller's uh, filmography. I highly encourage that. Um, he did The Strain, which is yeah, the uh, show you watch. Uh, the Box and Gone Smooth, okay. which are early setup shows. Um, it's before Ephraim uh, uh, shaves his head. So, and um, actually, it, it's very early on, but they're they're both very good episodes at, at world building and um, and reveals. Actually, 
Yeah, was it there was a Del Toro directed the pilot and then he came on for like the next episode or something like that? Yeah, I think okay. so. All right. The first few episodes of The Strain are so good at world building. Like seeing that he worked on those is really I think important because they brought in somebody that's really adept at taking whatever, you know, hour long time frame you have and just cramming a ton of story into it and never making it feel crowded. Well, as far as pilots are concerned, he seems to be like a go-to guy when it comes yeah. to to directing pilots. He's like he's like the wolf from uh, from Pulp Fiction. You know, if you need <laughs> nice. if you need to get something done and you need to make sure that it's done right, <laughs> you you call up uh, David Semmel to direct <laughs> your pilot, and it's almost like a guarantee that it's like that thing's going to get on the air. He directed pilots for Life, Person of Interest. Madam Secretary, The Man in the High Castle, Code Black, and the upcoming David E. Kelly show, Goliath. Uh, so yeah, uh, pretty pretty cool um, stuff in there. And he also uh, directed a movie, Lone Star State of Mind, which I haven't seen. I haven't seen it either, but I have a silly feeling that maybe it's in our future. We, we might look at it, you never know. Um, but you know, he also did something which uh, is very near and dear to my heart. I mean, you look at this <laughs> this this filmography and it's like, wow, you know, he's done some amazing shows and he's done some very high profile work. But to me, the thing which stood out, the thing where I was like, oh, my God, time to get excited, time to get unreasonably excited was when I saw that he was a director of Dawson's Creek. A lot of episodes of Dawson's Creek, but very specifically, he directed the first season finale of Dawson's Creek. Now, I love very, very specifically season one of Dawson's Creek, and I feel like that tells like a complete story. And mm -hmm. like season two, I'm like, why are we still watching this? Um, but the I thought that the way that season one ended was perfect, and I have said on many many occasions that the first season finale of Dawson's Creek is damn near flawless filmmaking I'm a really big fan of high school melodrama I think that that it's mm -hmm. that high school is sort of like the perfect like microcosm for society because you've got like everything all of the elements of society at play like shoved into one building and and i think that that's kind of like perfect and i think that that season one dawson's creek i don't know maybe it's because i was like in high school when it aired and and that was sort of like you know i could totally relate to to, to what's going on i wanted to be a filmmaker i was dawson just you know not nearly as as pretty um <laughs> Whoa, whoa, hey, <laughs> hey, hey. I, w I won't stand for that talk. Okay. That is untrue. All right, all right, fair enough. You didn't see me in high school, so you know. <laughs> um, but yeah, Dawson's Creek, season one finale, fantastic. I was so excited. I rewatched it last night. See, you and I are very different people, Mike. I mean, I think people have sussed that out over time. Perhaps. But I'm sitting here talking about, oh, Hannibal, yeah, the killer with the beehive and turning people into bees. <laughs> and you're like, high school melodrama. And, it's the greatest thing. And I mean, I love that about us. I love that about us. And, and I'm sure that when I get to Hannibal, I'm going to love that stuff too. And I, I love Silence of the Lambs and I love Manhunter and I love Hannibal the movie. You know, it's, it's an amazing movie. It exists. But I also love Dawson's Creek, you know? And I get excited because it's like, oh, you know, that show. And, and you know, like on that, that show, I, I, I'd be like, oh, you know, this episode's directed by the guy who did Halloween H2O. And this this Ugh. show is, is run by the guy who, who wrote Scream. And, and the Scream ripoff episode or whatever is directed by Rodman Flender, the director of Idle Hands and Leprechaun 2. But now to think that, yes, you know, maybe the best episode of the show is from the director of, you know, the new Star Trek series or vice versa. That makes me super excited. So, you know what I love, though, what I absolutely love is the fact that we can get this excited about it. Looking at the creators, I think that is so tr that, you know, that that speaks so much to the mission of our show. 
of uh, not just getting excited because there's a Star Trek series coming out or, oh, hey, there's going to be a spaceship or, oh, hey, what timeline it's going to be on. But, oh, you know, this person wrote that, this person directed this. And so we can get excited because, I, I mean, even if you haven't seen what is apparently the greatest hour of television, <laughs> which is the Dawson's Creek season one series, season finale. Yes. Um, like, even if you haven't seen that, this guy's resume like th- this is like you said that you look at this resume, even if you haven't seen all but one thing on it, you look at it and you say, "Wow, they're this guy is really knowing what he's doing." He's, like th- this is the guy you like you said he's the wolf. You bring him in. Yeah, I mean, even if no one's seen CSI, you know, you know what CSI is. You know how big right. of a show that is, and it's like this guy is, you know, big time. But. Yeah, I mean, looking at all these things, I'm like, oh, that's fantastic, you know, and we can, you know, certainly talk about House now, and and that's great, but, I mean, the first thing I thought of was, oh, yeah, audio commentary for the first season finale of Dawson's Creek, this is going to be amazing, I can't wait to (laughs) wax poetic about Dawson's Creek on this Star Trek podcast, Um, and that's what we do. Joey and Pacey? Were those the character names? There was Joey, and there was Pacey, and there was Dawson, okay. and and there yes. was, and there was uh, Jennifer. I I got I got to be honest. I'm I'm a couple of years older. The only thing I remember is that song from the show. Well, it, that was great, but like in the finale, no, no, of, that is not the word it, I was going to go with for that song, Mike. <laughs> do not, do not. No, you couldn't escape that song. That song was like laundry detergent. It was just everywhere. It, it it was it was a great song, you know. But but this this finale is also sort of known for a, a particularly um, memorable and um, very very uh, skillfully crafted sequence. I mean, extremely skillfully craft, crafted sequence, which was set to Edwin McCain's "I'll Be." You know the song. I'm sure that I do. There's I'll probably some sort of be. You know that that song. Oh, yeah. I'm not going to okay. go any further with it, I know that. but you know it. You've never... You, have we ever heard you sing? Uh, probably This is the not. first time that, that we've heard Mike sing on one of his shows. It's in my DNA. My mom is a uh, is a professional um, singer and uh, organist slash piano player for the uh, Catholic Archdiocese. So, you know... There you go. It's in my, it's in my blood. I am, I am, a, I am a, <laughs> uh, a musical person, um, genetically speaking. <sighs> but um yes not uh, not in practice though okay yeah um but yes yes Dawson's Creek check it out season 1 finale amazing amazing if you were going crack. to recommend that somebody were to check out in preparation for creator materials season 1 of Dawson's Creek or Wonderfalls which would you say Look, I'm really enjoying Wonderfalls. You know, so far mm-hmm. I've thought that every episode is pretty great. Uh, and I guess maybe perhaps if you want a better idea of 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 the people making this show, like I'm guessing that David Seymour isn't like, well, if you're going to watch one episode from my filmography, it's the, the first season finale of Dawson's Creek. <laughs> but honestly, like if, if I'm excited about, you know, one single thing you know from all the stuff that these people have done i mean is it the very very best thing that they've ever done maybe not but is it the thing which i i am most in love with yeah totally i Uh, hey man i am not judging you know i am not judging yeah no i know i just think it's cool it's yeah but yeah dawson's creek season one finale right at the top of the list i have to say so all right Yes. I'll have to put it in the queue. Revisit Dawson <laughs> and yeah. his creek. Yes, yes. Did the creek ever flood? I don't know, because I've only seen season one. Like, <laughs> oh, And here's the okay. thing about it. Like, Here's the thing about it, and, and speaks to, to the quality of that, of that finale. Like, you go through season one, and you're all leading up to this, this, this moment, and then you see that episode, and you're like, oh my God, like this is going to be a really long summer. Like I can't wait until season two starts. And then season two starts and you're like, yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I guess really kind of what they are talking about it is sort of very metatextually in, in this, the first season finale, which is like, 
you know, cliffhangers. Oh my God, you know, they're just marketing gimmicks and whatnot. But what if things change and it all goes back to being the same thing? And I, I feel like you reached a height with that first season finale of Dawson's Creek that I couldn't wait to see what came next. And then when they started it up, I was like, oh, okay, well, yeah, I guess there's really no way that you could live up to, to, the, uh, to, to the high bar which was set mm. by this one particular episode, and I kind of don't care. And even though I've gone back and watched the first season of Dawson's Creek like three times, I have never had any desire to watch season two. I know that sounds weird, but that's kind of how it is. So David Semmel yes. is so good that it, it could just blow your socks off so much. Here's hoping he doesn't do that well with the Star Trek Discovery <laughs> pilot. We want people to watch the second episode. Yes, yes, yes. And I'm yeah. sure he wants people to watch it because I think he was heavily involved in like season two of Dawson's Creek. And I'm not yeah. saying that he did a bad job or anything like that. I just feel like he, you know, closed the loop. I mean, sure. very, very literally. Like, And the way that it's directed is sort of fantastic. Like, There's a, a lot of mirroring of the the first episode of 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 Dawson's Creek season 1 and the last episode of Dawson's Creek season 1 and it really does feel like you're ending a story they did, they told a really good last chapter in in that in cool. that story and whatever okay so we've talked no, about No man Dawson's I, Creek I, for... I you're you're actually selling me on the idea of actually watching Dawson's Creek it's really good i mean if you're a fan of movies you know i mean tons of movie references throughout that entire first season well, and uh, Kevin Williamson not really surprised by that no and I love Kevin Williamson as a as a writer and uh yeah <laughs> that's one of the reasons why I'm looking forward to this time after time show even though the early reviews coming out of San Diego have not exactly been fantastic but I, that doesn't no, that's okay me. the early reviews for the X-Files revive oh okay I see your point <laughs> well, you know, I'm not going to touch that because I thought, you know, I mean, my, my whole take on the X-Files revival is like, you can wrong. give me five of the worst hours in television history as long as you give me Mulder and Scully meet the wear monster. And I'm going to be like, They met yes. your challenge. They met your challenge, Mike. <laughs> you said, give me five of the worst hours on TV. And just give me the the where person one. And they said, all right, you know what, Mike, we can do that for you. And if they want to do that again, I'll be like, do it. Because, you know, that episode is one of the best episodes in television history. And it's one of the best yeah. episodes of The X-Files. So, yeah, do it. If they want to do that again, you can just tell me all about it. Okay, I will. Yeah. I will. And you're missing out. So. I guess so. <laughs> <sighs> anyway, <laughs> perhaps we should wrap this up, shall we? Let's. Well, it's been fun talking about Star Trek Beyond. Finally, new Star Trek today. But that's not all we're talking about this week. Well, let's not kid ourselves. That pretty much is everything that anyone's talking yeah, about the, this week. It's really dominating conversations. <laughs> it really is. But here's a look at uh, some of the other shows which may be talking about Star Trek Beyond. Previously on Trek.fm, The Ready Room. We've been waiting so long to cover material and it's still not covered yet. And now we might go to the complete other extreme and let's just jet through it all as fast as we can. Damn you, Brian Fuller. You've given <laughs> us too much Star Trek too fast. <laughs> the Orb. You, you put your uh, action figures on the on, on the table or, or whatever in your house. Uh, you know, they don't move, <laughs> you know. Well, I'll tell you one thing. I've got one of Picard right over there. And when he doesn't do what I want, I put him in the box. <laughs> and I put it in the cabinet. <laughs> Straighten your shirt, Picard. Melodic treks. Over a period of 18 years... McCarthy composed 257 entries of the various Star Trek series, making him the biggest contributor to the sound of the franchise. Meta Trex. Well, I, I mean, if you're just talking sheer cool, I don't think there's any argument that uh, Worf and Jadzia's wedding was just absolutely cool. There was a dramatic element to it. It wasn't just a ceremony Performative of... bloodletting. <laughs> yeah. That's how, that's how Klingon weddings go. And that's what else is happening on Trek.fm. 
So check out these shows and find out what we're talking about in your favorite corner of the Star Trek universe and beyond. Beyond! <laughs> um, and by, by and beyond, we mean and beyond, yes. You'll find us wherever you get your podcasts. If you're an Apple user, be sure to hit the subscribe button. That helps us out greatly and makes it easier for other listeners to find the show as they search iTunes. If you're not an Apple user, we've got you covered as well. You can find us on Stitcher, TuneIn, SoundCloud, Windows Phone. And, of course, you can stream and download the MP3 file from our website or grab the RSS link as well. As always, we want to thank our associate producers, Jeff Sutter and Chris Steftenagel, for their uh, everlasting support of, of our small endeavor. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. And if you would like to follow in their footsteps, go to patreon.com slash trekfm and become a patron of the network. If you visit patreon.com slash trekfm, that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash trekfm, you'll find our current goals and different milestone contribution levels, along with all the great perks we have for you, including early access to content, exclusive content, producer credits, seats on our content development team, and more. We really appreciate any support you can give us and hope you'll join the team. And again, you'll find all the details at patreon.com slash trekfm. If you really want to help us out, you could also leave us a review in iTunes. Um, you know, that, that really sort of like makes everything uh, much more visible for people who are looking for for the show and, and all that good stuff. And um, hey, we're going to have a little contest for for iTunes reviewers yes. here on this show. Um, when I went to that that screening of uh, the movie, the trilogy um, in IMAX, uh, IMAX gave out posters, which were just for that that screening. And it's a pretty cool poster. It's got this this really cool art of uh, I think it's Spock and, and Bones. I think. Yeah, it looks like Spock and Bones. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll make it the show art for this week so that everyone can kind of take a peek at, at, at how great it is. And uh, my friend Matt, who went to the movie with me, was like, hey, you can take this poster and uh, give it away on your podcast. And I thought, oh, that's a great idea. So leave us a review on iTunes, and we'll we'll keep this going through August. Yeah, August sounds good. Okay. Yeah, let's we'll, we'll, let's announce it on the the fiftieth anniversary show. That sounds great. Okay, perfect. All right. Okay, cool. So uh, we have to limit this to America, the United States of America. I apologize. Sorry, y'all. Sorry. Sorry. But uh, but yeah, leave us a review, and uh, we appreciate your support. Okay, if you want to contact us, you can find the network on Twitter at Trek FM or on Facebook at facebook dot com slash Trek FM. Or you can uh, hit us up on the Babel Conference, which is Trek FM's listener forum. Just type the Babel Conference, that's B-A-B-E-L, into the search field on Facebook or go to our website at trek.fm and click the discussion tab on the menu bar. Where can people find you, John? Uh, Kessel Junkie on Twitter and just about everywhere else. You can find me on Aggressive Negotiations, a Star Wars podcast I co-host with Trek FM's own Matt Rushing over on the Nerd Party Network. And on another podcast called Words with Nerds that I co-host with my pal Craig. Where can people find you, Mike? Uh, you can find me right here on Trek FM, producing from there to here, Trek FM's daily rewatch of Star Trek, all 729 episodes now, uh, from beginning yes. to end. And you can also find me on Twitter at Mumbles3K. All right. Well, we made it to beyond. We made it beyond where we were before. Yes. And now we can finally shift our attention fully to the, the new series, Star Trek Discovery, which, yes, which we actually we can discover can, yeah. what's, ha what's coming. Um, but next week, what we're going to do, since there is a new Star Trek movie, and I love the fact that there's a new Star Trek movie coming out, we are going to give our picks for who we think should direct it. A special Trek.fm Earl Grey event announcement for Star Trek Las Vegas. Listeners, 
You know Bridgemates from Earl Grey episodes 82, 109, and 141, as well as To the Journey, 117, and Standard Orbit 102. There is even the original trivia panel show Encounter at All Good Things from Earl Grey 137. So Earl Grey is proud to announce a live presentation of Super Bridgemates at the Star Trek Las Vegas 50th Anniversary Convention on Friday, August 5th from 12.30 to 1.15 p.m. It will be held at the Roddenberry Stage at Quark's Bar at the Rio. Your favorite team here at Earl Grey of Free Enterprise will attempt to escape defeat, again, against two rival Bridgemate teams, Team Lizard Babies, Charlene Schmidt and Tristan Riddell, and the Council of Mistresses, Andy Vanderkolk and Jera Hodge. When it comes to celebrating the 50th anniversary of Star Trek, regular Bridgemates simply won't do. And that's why this game show will be Super Bridgemates, a fun-filled comedic game show involving fans, cosplayers, and audience members. Not only will the teams compete in hilarious trivia, but those in the audience will participate by acting out selected scenes from our favorite Star Trek moments, and cosplayers will help create puzzles for the teams to solve. It's all about the love of Trek. So we hope all the listeners who will be coming to Star Trek Las Vegas will join us, Earl Grey, and all your favorite co-hosts and fellow listeners for Super Bridgemates at Star Trek Las Vegas at the Roddenberry Stage. <laughs>